So, I'd like everyone to stand up, please. Everybody, get out your seat, stand up. Yeah, I'm a photo. Yeah, fall asleep. This is so important, I want you to read with me. Read with me. Multi device, multi touch, user centric. Repeat. Repeat. There's been an awakening. Our concept of society has evolved and the business landscape has shifted faster than we ever thought possible. The industry of data and analytics is at the heart of this change. Something we need to recognize about the industry that we're in right now. You asked me about what's changed. I think the scale of this market, the size of this market, and therefore the potential of this market is absolutely massive. The digital world just got a lot bigger. Cars, watches, wearable technologies, appliances, TVs, everything is connected, or this or next year will be connected, anything that's new that's coming out. The landscape is, is becoming more and more complex and, and difficult to track in, in the digital analytics space. How does digital analytics really be digital analytics? How do we move beyond websites and mobile apps, which is kind of where digital analytics has been, into everything else that's connected? And, and this is the year, I think, where, where it's really going to be the breakaway year for the Internet of Things, for connected devices. This means that right now, we can have more signals, more data points that tell us in combination with our empathy, how users want to consume our services, want to consume our products, whatever device they're using, wherever they are, whenever they are, that's exciting. And it's exciting because it's right now. That's a hugely, hugely important change that we get used to that and start thinking more about it. It is, the, the, the multiple device issue has made this very, very obvious to us all that that's what we need to consider. We're living in interesting times where the whole connected world is changing rapidly. As analysts, we now have to rethink how we approach this new paradigm. Telling the story, delivering the actionable insight and taking the action, that's where, we, that's where data becomes the competitive advantage. Data is an asset, but they don't use it like an asset. It would be like buying a machine or uh, inventory of product and putting it in a warehouse but never using it or never selling it. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't invest in an asset and then not use it. I think if we fail to recognize the pace at which the users are moving, if we get behind the mobile curve anymore, then that's a huge risk. I think inactivity and fear and still relying too much on opinion rather than using this great tool of data, this great asset of data and using it in the right way. If we're still destined to deliver reports and expect that that is what is going to drive change, that is what's going to drive the cultural change top down, then we're going to fail there. And the threat is if you don't start getting some value from it, at some point is somebody going to say, oh, well, then we shouldn't do the analytics. We shouldn't collect the data because we're not using it. Should you? Maybe we should all just go home and not do analytics, which I think would be bad. The problem is not collecting data, the problem is the lack of using the data. But what does it mean to use the data? You need to slow down. You need to humble yourself. You need to constantly rethink your approach to keep up with the pace of change. The next step is, become, is people become more critical towards the data. So it's not just about getting data, it's about getting data that's actually meaningful to your business. And that's, and that's a big challenge. Who will survive? I think it's going to come down to data. The difference will be he who has the best data wins. And what I mean by that is Everybody at CES, like the world's kind of biggest technology show, talked about data. Every session was about data. If you went to a session it was about one thing, it inevitably became about data. And the thing they were talking about, though, was data about 
people, which is not bad data, it's definitely data, but they were missing two kinds of data. The connection between marketing and communications, and data about how the customer uses the thing. People weren't talking about how do we improve products by understanding how they get used. People were talking about the data about the customers, but that's a different use of the data. So just like we do analytics on a website to understand how people use a website so that we can make the website better, digital analytics should be analyzing anything that's digitally connected to understand how it gets used so it can be made better. And I think that's, that's an opportunity that I have a suspicion is undervalued or under-recognized. And so I hope that, that it's an industry um, that, that is seen and that companies recognize the, the value and the importance and the opportunity to extend what their digital analytics off websites and apps into everything that's connected. It's a chain of events that we have to be uh, very aware of, saying that things are no longer separated. It's still the same customer, the same customer that sees the ad, that clicks to the website, that researches the product, that goes and buys it, and then uses it. It's the same customer through that entire journey. So we should be measuring everything from the ad through to the last day that they're using the product. And very often we see very ambitious things when it comes to analytics uh, without the, the uh, data actually having the same quality. So data governance is about at all time ensuring that your data is in order. Because if it isn't, it's like having a compass that isn't aligned. You might be going in the complete wrong direction. At the end of the day, data that will win and what will differentiate you from everybody else is if you're solving problems for people, ultimately. If you solve human problems, what that will do is it defines and retains your market. Every business or organization on the planet exists to solve a problem for somebody. And if you don't solve a problem for somebody, you might get funding for your startup, but you're not probably going to go anywhere. And if you fail to solve problems or keep solving problems for your customers and making their lives better, then you're not going to be around. Uh, of, of the wearables companies, I think most will fail or, or will get bought. They're not going to be there. there. There cannot be that many companies in the industry. Of all the startups, that I saw at CES, of which there were hundreds. Most of those in a year or two probably will not be around. But I think if we were to look at every single one that is around, we'd see two key traits. One, they have a real market for a real need. And two, they're using data effectively, or more effectively than the competition in, in what they're doing. And they're, they're understanding this equation, the equation of the digital world and the physical world, and being able to tie this together. And all the big brands that I have discussions with and that I meet know this. They also know that they're very bad at it. And they know that the best place for the ones that have a retail space in the physical world is what happens in the shop. So that's one prediction for the future. I think anyone that has a physical presence will, in the next few years, need to think about how can you tap that as a very key data source and, and use it in your brand building and your digital dialogues. How do we start to tie more closely the data from the physical world with the digital world? And I think that's the next big challenge. And it's one that's being addressed through more and more devices and connected devices and internet-enabled things. And it's one that, as an industry, we're going to have to deal with. And as have been raised already, and I'm sure will be throughout the rest of this conference, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of, of danger areas. Yeah, I think the biggest threat probably this year is, is going to be around, continues to be the privacy debate and uh, legislation around privacy. Maybe one of the presentations this week, or maybe something I saw on Twitter quite recently, somebody showing just a really crude thing, which was uh, Google Trend Search reporting on privacy, privacy, and revealing that it wasn't a major concern at the moment with the public. That could tip. Not huge, yet bubbling away. It only requires something to happen to, to, uh, to encourage people to, to be much more concerned about it. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that it's specific to 
our industry and tracking or anal analytics, it only requires something to do with online security to start getting the public, general public, more rattled. And there have been all these shocking breaches in the last year or so. The laws in the European Union around cookies, I don't, I don't think that was maybe the best approach to solve the problem and stop the bad players. So you know, in the US, we don't really have much legislation at this point, but I think as there are continued discussions about should we create laws around privacy and, um, and data, my concern would be that, that those would be created in a way that would hurt good analytics and wouldn't stop bad analytics. If there is much more of that, and there probably will be, there is a risk that people are going to just generally suddenly treat it as an issue. Whatever happens, whatever is decided, there will always be and there will always need to be regulation. At the same time, this regulation must facilitate, not impede, this transition to a new, even-handed society whose roots stretch back to the start of the millennium. It's actually really kind of a big year in my mind. It has been 10 years since Google Analytics uh, came onto the market back in, in late 2005. Uh, they, they sort of have truly become uh, the platform in nature where the, the, the challenge then lies up to the imagination of user or imagination of analyst, how do they use them versus the capability of tools. So that's sort of an inflection that tool capability is no more a, a sort of a barrier to carry out certain analysis. Google, smartly or fully, purely evil, thought, what if we give data to everybody? And I think that thought really is one that changed the digital world immensely. For better or worse, Google did something incredible. They took what was this very limited, hard to get to thing and made it available to the masses. Can you imagine a world today without Google Analytics, without access to basic data, let alone advanced custom integration, measuring the Internet of Things data? Advanced segments? I, I would probably literally die if I didn't have advanced segments. The problem is, with a tool like Google Analytics, or really any tool, the data you get out of it is only going to be as good as the thought and the thinking and the planning that you put into implementing it. More and more the industry is, at least the practitioners here know that you, know, you can't be just bound to the tool. That you need to be able to think beyond the tool to the, to the business questions that are, that are at hand. And I see sort of Two, sort, two levels of you know, content here. One, how do I leverage what the vendors are giving me to be effective, make decisions, and make the most out of the tools? Because that's what they're for. The vendors provide these tools so that we can do good things with them and they're getting better and better. But also to think strategically and to think, think beyond it and uh, you know, the limitations of tools because tools are limited. One of the big misconceptions going around is that there is such a thing as plug-and-play analytics. Indeed, all tools and platforms need to be configured and tailored to each business, project, and need. Just as all businesses are unique, all configurations need to be idiosyncratic as well. The split testing, for example, has been sold to people as a very cheap and readily available and very powerful tool, which it is, but it used to be, has to be used in an, in an intelligent way. And a large number of people have not done so and have therefore never been able to quite deliver on the promises that the vendors and then they, the specialists implementing it, have suggested. They've done stupid things like run tests and just assume that this will apply to the uh, ongoing future of the site and the lift doesn't happen for a whole load of reasons which Craig explained in great detail. The result you get is not a precise value, it's a range. So let's say version A is 3% conversion and version B is 4%. Woo! 25%! We're going to get 25% more revenue all year long. Wow, where's my raise? Can I hire new people? Let's tell everyone around the company and send an email you're just about to make yourself look like an asshole. 
right? When it goes live, you find you get 5.7%. And everyone says to you, you've promised us 25%. Where is it? That's the problem. It's because it's a range. If it was 3% plus minus 0.5, it could be as high as 3.5 or as low as 2.5. And the same with the 4%. It could be higher or lower. It's a range. I think the main problem actually is this other issue that we never really talk about in testing is that really we never take random samples. Never, we, it's impossible to take a real random sample in online testing. We're really taking convenient samples and that means that there's usually some sort of temporal confounding that's happening, right? So our data is really has cycles to it, right? Time of day, day of week, what have you. And so the, the, the problem with running a bandit or any sort of sequential test in that environment is that the the, the data is not, um, is not really representative of the whole sample. And that's probably where the main issue is. And that's, that's true of, of, of really sampling in general. Even if you test A versus A, the testing software will conclude a lot of the time that actually one of the versions of A is much better than the other. Now, if you can run a test with two identical things and get that answer, you can see the problem in calling it wrongly when you're testing two completely different things. If you're trying to optimize a, a process, you want to stop thinking, I would argue you don't really want to think about winners and losers. You're trying to think about uh, a portfolio of actions that you're taking over, over time, and you want to maximize that portfolio. My portfolio is all the tests. And so you want to get the total, uh, the, the greatest total discounted sum of rewards from that portfolio. And the question is, is A-B testing going to be the optimal way to do that? And the thing is, you're not measuring individual ingredients of tests here. You're measuring how the whole recipe works together. Which of these combinations of tests actually work in harmony to give you the biggest conversion further down the line? You want to use your people, you know, efficiently. And so this is just like a way of helping scale. And when you have very complex problems, really the only way to solve, and we're talking about multi-step, multi-channel, attribution, decision attribution, what have you, you have sort of this very complicated problem that sits in like a very large dimensional space. And um, you know, when we're thinking about these in intelligent systems, it's, it's, not, it's not really going to be efficient to have people solving some of these lower level problems. Like you're not going to be worried about, um, you know, which offer should be displayed at what time, right? That, you can let the system figure that out based upon how users are behaving. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that is, is just an added component of the toolkit. And this is the, this is the type of stuff that Google does all the time. When they're doing their ad placements, um, it's, 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 it's contextual bandits, it's this, they do that. One of the other growing areas we see is marketing automation, where people tie their data into automating the processes because we get even less uh, time all the time because more and more tools in, the, in, in our daily work. So this uh, extra focus on automation will actually give more value to, to the businesses. I think in general, the, the, the utility of of automating some decisions is, is you, you really want to think about um, your decisions in almost like a hierarchy. And so you have, a, uh, at, the, at the base of the, the pyramid or the, the iceberg, I guess, you have all these, um, these high transaction, low risk decisions, right? They're relatively low value, but, there's, but you want to, it's not really worth it maybe to have your, your analysts spending time on price A versus price B or experience A versus experience B. You want them to be thinking about the bigger picture. And so in a way this helps you scale because you can, you can push these sort of lower level decisions into the application layer and you can kind of let the application figure it out, like the headlines, like what out of a subset of, out of two or three headlines, what's optimal. You don't really want to be spending your, your, your analytics resources on figuring that out. You, know, you, you have more important things to figure out. So in, on one hand, it helps you scale your decisions. But on the other, that's what I was talking about before with the domain expert. Th this needs to be guided, right? The, the system in of itself doesn't know how to, it, it doesn't know what the set of options really should be, right? So you guys are brainstorming and you're thinking, well, based upon 
our past experience, we kind of think this type of um, experiment or these treatments might have some sort of efficacy, right? And that's where you guys come in. And then you decide whether or not it's something you want the application to sort of figure out, and then you can push that into the application. There are still a lot of problems. There's a lot of companies who are not doing this stuff right, and they buy the tools, but they don't invest the time to set them up correctly. So they're maybe measuring the wrong things, or they think they have the right data and it's not correct. So this is a very common problem, and I, I think we all have a duty to try and uh, work with the companies that we're working with to explain some of the things that we've learned here at the conference. And a lot of the big takeaways are about how to do this stuff right. And if you get it right, then the, then the data and the insights that flow from this can totally transform your business online. And, and that's why it's important. Yes, it's about analytics, but it's about analytics in a business sense. And it's about how you can get actionable insights from this stuff and turn it into stuff uh, that you can do. So it's not just about reading reports or looking at dashboards. It's how do I get useful data out of my site that I can take an action with that will actually improve my business, bring in more revenue, higher profit, or make my customers really, really happy. One thing is certain is that the sophistication of the technology is advancing very quickly and the costs involved in doing it uh, have decreased significantly. They haven't decreased all the way. In, you know, implementation is still a huge, huge cost for us all. And indeed, analysis is an extremely costly thing at the moment. So costly, in fact, that not very much resource is ever spent on it. You know, people just implement and buy tools and don't do things. What Christopher was proposing actually would, in some way, reduce the cost of the interpretation aspect. It actually is switching it over into the technology, if you like, and getting that to do it for us much faster and better than we could. And he's starting to explore not just using our existing data to predict into the future, but also to dynamically use that in real time, using machine, machine intelligence or whatever, to actually start dynamically altering what we're showing to people, what we're offering to them in real time. So using the data to actually drive changes in a way that's not possible at the moment for most of us. Uh, he was suggesting that they're already beginning to start doing it. My approach has been from a quantitative approach to say how can we rethink the role of analytics and the role of data in this meeting between brands and consumers. Somewhere in the middle. If you attended the, uh, the panel we had earlier, I was trying to say some of the same. Saying there is all this noise happening between us as consumers and brands today in marketing, in advertising, in, in all these dialogues that we as analysts need to have a much better understanding of and as brands need to be much better at, I don't want to say control, but facilitate those dialogues powered by data. That in the medium term seems to me that's the way we're going and although what Christopher was talking about was hugely, hugely beyond the resources of most, most small or medium-sized organizations. I think in time that's going to become much easier to do and cheaper. I don't know how. <laughs> the Golden Punch Card Contest I think is a great part of Super Week. It's a competition, there's a competitive nature, but it's all with goodwill, so all of the participants are excited to share, you know, new things. Well, I'm just annoyed that I didn't win it, and you know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not bitter about that at all. The, the, the value of um, the, 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 uh, the examples that were shown during the punch card, there was a question that was asked on every single one, are you going to open source that? I think 90% of people said, yes, I'm going to open source this solution so that we can all benefit from this cool, fantastic thing that's been, uh, been presented. I was just actually totally blown away, amazed and very impressed by the amount of innovation that, uh, that the community that's here, the attendees here at Super Week, demonstrated. The material that was presented as part of the punch card prize, fantastic, so exciting. I saw some stuff there that was like, ah, oh, my God, this really blew my mind. That was absolutely fantastic. And it is a great demonstration of the, the collaborative nature of Super Week. All great minds coming together and sharing great stuff. I think this kind of hack hackathon type thing is really fun 
and it makes the difference from you know seeing conference sessions to have ones where you have a limited amount of time and you've really got to be good to explain your idea you know you have a five minute pitch for this uh, and then you know the audience gets to vote on it so you know it's, it's a prize decided by everybody who's here and yeah I, I would say it's, it's pretty hard to win it. One of the submissions that uh, that came from my team was uh, automated alert tracking using Google Analytics real-time API um, which was you know I thought to be a very novel solution to a important problem that was from a real-life case so I could share that with with a community of people who are interested in it and said, wow, that makes sense to us too. We have similar problems. We need alerts and the real-time API can, can do that at scale and, and that's valuable. Vendors are sort of waking up with uh, opening up the, their data model. So, so with the API, the data is starting to be available very easily. And this, this, this critical change is something which I'm extremely happy about, as well as I see it'll open up the boundaries of innovation that was sort of limited to the vendors. But now, uh, with the data model being opened up, which is there, and more people are interested in building the solutions, which are niche solutions, uh, uh, and, and, and the market is ready to sort of uh, you know, uh, use these solutions for the specific niche problems that they have. That was a lot of fun to see the breadth and, and depth of innovation and uh, you know the, the tools that Yeshua is uh, working on and Simo's uh, GTM tools. Amazing. It's just, it's fabulous. Yeah, here we go. So um, GTM tools is a tool set I wrote um, uh, in October for the Google Tag Manager version 1. This is the publication of the next version, the evolutionary version of the tool set. Um, it works. <laughs> hey, 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 we don't have time for that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, oh, so um, this only works in the new version of GTM. Um, you can do stuff as before. For example, here are all the containers you have in your accounts. There's the visualization tool where you can actually see a D3JS visualization of your container, as you can see now. So the other thing, important thing, you can clone your containers. So you can, you can take a container and clone it through the API into any other account. If there's a naming conflict, so you already have a container with that name, it automatically uh, creates a, a copy of it. So you don't have to worry about naming conflicts. Uh, the UI is a bit better than last time. I'm still not a visual developer, so it's still just based on Bootstrap. Um, as you can see now, this is GTM, so you can see that the new container is their copy of, you know, that's how it works. So you can copy containers from one account to another speeds things up a lot. Let me skip forward just a bit. And the biggest thing in this new version is the shopping cart. So you can inspect a container, see all, all the stuff about it, and then you can pick from different containers in various accounts. Um, just go on Simo from last night, hurry up, click that, yes, click tags. You can add stuff to your cart, tags, variables, rules, you can add that to your cart. As you can see, there, there's the card in the upper right-hand corner. You can find what kind of links these tags have and add them at the same time, because you don't want to add tags if they have triggers and variables. You want to add everything into the card at once. So you're, cre you're kind of like creating, a, you're shopping around for tags that you think are really cool. And once you've done that, you go to your card page. You can see what's in your card. You can remove stuff if you want to. Um, and the next thing you can do, oops, is you can clone your cart. So now you've got the stuff in your cart, tags from all these different containers. All the links are preserved, so if they have triggers, you can create a new container in any account and just clone the cart contents into that. So that way you can actually create containers on the fly. Pick cool tags and variables and rules from other containers, what other people have or where you have access to, and combine them into GTM as a completely new container that should work right away. The last thing is you can save the card. So not, let's say you have your cool container now in your card. You have all these different tags. And you know you're going to reuse this in all your different, different um, properties later on. You can save the card in a thing I call the asset library, which you can find in the main navigation up there. Hold on, let me just do, empty the card first. That's right. Well done. Go to library. No, up there. That's it. Click it. Now you can see these are my stored containers in my library. They're user ID based, so I only see my own ones. I can visualize again what was in this saved card. I can see it right now. Just press it, come on, guys. And here's another, now I can see what I had just saved. So I can actually maintain a database of my favorite containers.
My three favourites were Simo, uh, who uh, has always been doing cool stuff and giving stuff away that saves millions of hours of time around the planet and I, I have total respect for that guy. Simo's done a great job. Two years on the trot, we need to do something about this. We need to respond and do like Simo and really think further ahead, you know, think beyond the end of our nose and look at the horizon and that's where we should be shooting for. Because um, that keeps our, uh, that keeps us all on our toes. Uh, we're thinking uh, innovatively every single step of the way, and we've really got to push him next year. We've got to make sure that he has a tough time. Uh, Joshua's idea for debugging uh, the analytics tracking in um, native apps uh, running on mobile phones is really cool and very clever, and that's something that I'd be very interested in using, and I know a lot of other people would. Raise your hand if you have heard of mobile devices. Everyone, okay. Raise your hand if you have heard of apps. Raise your hand if you think that it may be important within the digital analytics stack to track mobile devices and apps. Raise your hand if you have ever tried to debug them. A few, it's a pain in the ass, right? It's, it can be really difficult to to debug mobile devices and apps. So we came up with the solution of a hardware-based, super easy app debugging, okay? I'm gonna show an example of how this works in real time, assuming the internet does not fail me. Okay, basically what I'm going to do is connect to my little hardware device. I put in the default IP address of the, of the management panel because the device gets its own IP address via DHCP. So once I do, on my phone, once that happens, I'll see on my phone, right, that screen. The screen on my phone says, here's your IP address that you need to connect to to be on the local network, right? Once I get that IP address, I just type that into my computer. Um, and then I'm in the debug box, okay? So I, I open up a website. Let's go to um, analyticspros.com, right? And once that fires, I can actually look at the events. You see that moved? I can look at their page view from my mobile device. But it gets better because some of the problems with mobile debugging have to do with the fact of apps and, and other mobile devices. If you're sending something through an SSL endpoint, you're going to have to have an intermediate CA certificate. So instead of going through the process of generating a certificate, storing it to local storage, going into security settings, opening it up. It's one click, literally from the, from the device. You get to this screen. It says, okay, I'll click that. You enter in whatever certificate name that you want. I typed in anything. And all of a sudden, I am going to an HTTPS site. We'll try. Uh, I have to put make it HTTPS. Du -du 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 -du. Okay. I go back to the debugger. And in real time, we are now seeing hits to that endpoint in HTTPS, bypassing all of the headache that you would need to do. Okay, so it's, it's loading 90%. All right, so assuming they have a good internet connection, you can debug your apps in, in real time from any mobile device, apps or, or HTTPS. Here's my mobile device. I have a page view, a timing hit. It's all there. And this is over a secure endpoint. Um, you can, if you really need to debug well, right, don't just send those apps to the UAID that your apps are going to everywhere and then have to filter it out and figure out what is your debugging session. Forward your hits to any property that you want. Just type in the name of the property, start forwarding, and then all of those hits that are coming from the app that are programmed to go to one place are going to exactly where you want it to go. Um, another problem that we had when we were de debugging vice, de devices um, for a large grocery store in, in Israel, um, th it was that um, somebody, let's say that they were in Spain trying to debug this thing, they couldn't access it because it was over a VPN. It said it can only work if you are in Israel, right? So with VPN routing, I can connect to wherever I want. So debugging apps with, with the need for VPN, hit forwarding, real-time SSL, getting away of all security, on a piece of hardware.
And uh, Ivan uh, also showed um, some technology that allows you to track uh, walk-in store visits or appointments with people and connect the, the website promotion with the outcome in your retail store. And it's a very simple little system, very well thought out, and I actually thought it was wonderful. What we came up with is how to measure offline conversions for small shops like with walk-ins only, they have the website, or the rentals, that they receive orders through telephone. So, that's the problem, how to measure these kind of conversions, how to transfer this data to either AdWords or analytics to measure the effect of the website, what, what happened on the website, how it translates to the really some sale. Solution, actually, uh, yes, we will use the measurement protocol, we will send some data to AdWords, uh, conversion data to AdWords. It's, that, it's not that easy. It's, uh, we think of the plugin for the WordPress. So uh, it doesn't suit any kind of big business because it's uh, based on some sort of uh, coupons or uh, small data information. So what we have, this is the problem. There is no data sent to analytics or AdWords. So we are going to do that. Basically, this is the solution. It's a three-part uh, three solution. We have the configuration on the WordPress, uh, let's say, uh, tag that we put on the articles page or post page, and we have the back-end page for entering the data for the pe people in the shop. So we have this situation, the client calling or arriving, bring unique piece of information. This is the key element that will let's say, allow us to send the data to AdWords and Analytics. So we need two people, the client and the person recording the data. <coughs> we thought of something called Easy ID. It's something, a piece of information. Uh, it's a text part and the number part, which is generated uh, inside uh, WordPress. So it's easy to remember and uh, it's a process that you should, should look like. User arriving website, uh, entering the sales funnel, arriving at the page that does have some sort of information. We, for this, in this case, we have something called Milk21. It can be any kind of combination, but it's sticking to session of the person. And we have, let's say, conversion window of 10 days or 15 days that we correlate with also data in AdWords. So some time passes, one, two, three days, uh, person arrives at the, uh, the store or let's say calling by phone uh, claiming his let's say discount with this, this specific code person at the store or uh, just uh, enters the WordPress at a specific page puts the, the, the code and sets, uh, pushes submit and that's it <laughs> Well, last night the, the bonfire was lit and we, uh, we took all the music gear outside and we were playing uh, DJing and then we, we carried on with the party in the hotel until really late. So uh, I'm going to need a rest when I get home because, you know, I, I have been working so hard and also talking to lots of people, but we've had fun together, you know. I've not had enough sleep. I go home to my wife and she's going to ask me, how are you? I'm tired. I need a rest. Well, it's been one of the craziest years of my life and I can attribute most of that to Super Week. You probably don't even know this, but it was my first conference in analytics in Europe. Um, I met all the nice people who are here this year as well and um, I made a lot of contacts. I've been doing a lot of conferences last year. One of the craziest years of my life, in a very good way, indeed. For the last year, a lot of analytics people that I know in the industry have been telling me about this event and this year I wanted to see for myself why it was important. I think one of the biggest things that I discovered was here right now in Hungary has been the largest concentration of analytics brain power that I've ever seen at any European conference. Here I've had deeper conversations with more people about stuff that's really important to me. So coming here in one place to find all of those people to get really high quality presentations, to socialize, to meet new people and make new contacts, it's been absolutely vital. And I'll definitely be coming again next year. Super Week is 
able to provide a lot of good feedback, you know, um, both on when, when people are presenting products or ideas. Um, and it's a very open community in terms of being able to share, hey, this is the things I'm doing now, what do you think about that? And this is a conference where people can get together and, and help each other and provide you know, criticism and feedback. I come here and always go away having learned so much from different people. And one of the great things about Super Week is because we're all together in the one place for, for three days, the exchange of information outside of the actual sessions is the biggest value. In my session, I was including, I added into the slides systems that some people have been describing to me that I heard about around the bonfire last night. You know, I went back from the bonfire, went and looked at the demo of, some, of a new sort of feedback system and think, this is really good. These guys in Poland are producing something that's really interesting here. This is fascinating. You learn about things like that so much quicker here than you do than just re you know, relying on what you read, see on Twitter or happen to come across. It's a wonderful, wonderful place for that. I've loved being here. It's been fantastic. It's an amazing hotel on a mountaintop and they've really looked after us very well. The food, the coffee, absolutely everything's been great. So, you know, I feel like I've had a holiday, but also my brain has taken a serious pounding, you know, so that's good. If I've come here and I'm working in this industry and I feel my brain has been stretched, then, you know, everybody who's working in analytics should come here and have their brain stretched. That's for sure. Well, one thing that I appreciate about Super Week um, is, is the openness and camaraderie. Right? that people um, come here, they're excited to be together and that there's a very open um, tone of, you know, of interaction. So th I, th I find it to be a place where everybody wants to help each other grow. People come to grow professionally um, and that they're willing to engage in conversations that are meaningful and, and will uh, foster professional growth be part of this community of digital analytics that is taking the last decade forward into the next decade and is going to be part of what I think is going to be a really amazing level of innovation, level of change and value for businesses, and really key in, in being part of making the world a better place by helping companies to use data to solve problems for their customers more effectively. Was that good? Brilliant! You yeah, got some good quotes. Cut it any way you like.